Forgetful to see the sky. Got a nice caboose. <laughs> Ooh. Hello and welcome back to Remake Hot Take, the podcast where we play studio executives pitching remake ideas of our favorite and new media. I'm Maria Schwarz. And I'm Brooke Reese. And in the month of Valentine's Day, some have dubbed February, you know, the month of love. We are revisiting. <laughs> we wouldn't know. <laughs> we are both single, <laughs> chronically so. Um, but, you know, that I doesn't... I wish I could get disability benefits. <laughs> for being for chronically single. <laughs> yeah, my doctor has filled out an FMLA <laughs> form. Um, I, I do need to miss work periodically to try to go on dating apps. <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a brutal, brutal landscape out there. Um, Have you been on 50 first dates already? No, (laughs) absolutely not. (laughs) Um, But yes, in this month of love, we are revisiting um, a movie that I had seen once before. Um, And Maria, had you seen this movie before? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, then it was a it was a rewatch for us both, but it's 50 first dates with Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore, which I believe just had an anniversary Mm-hmm. um what is that like 15 years or 20 years 20 or? it came out in 2004 okay yeah 20 year anniversary for this movie um and it doesn't i will... look a day over five no you can really tell that it is, <laughs> it is aged in the jokes yeah the humor is definitely aged i feel like adam sandler especially in his earlier films had like a lot of humor that was kind of towing the line even back then <laughs> um, well i was thinking about this and I think Adam Sandler is not my favorite. Like, it's not really like my cup of tea of humor. Mm -hmm. Um, Because a lot of it is like that kind of like fart jokes, like random, like noises. (laughs) I don't know. Um, And I was thinking about it. And I feel like the more palatable to like a general audience, Adam Sandler is Ben Stiller who still sometimes yes. had his like eh moments. So the more palatable Ben Stiller is Paul Rudd, who is for <laughs> who is made for a general audience. I don't know why that makes sense to me, but it makes sense to me. No, I, I completely get that Adam Stiller or Adam Stiller. <laughs> that it that's the love child between them both. No, I completely get the transition from Adam Sandler to Ben Stiller because when I was little watching these films I kind of thought that they were the same guy Mm -hmm. but Ben Stiller I feel like always plays like way toned down like he is usually like uh he's like Adam Sandler if he was on like an (laughs) antipsychotic like if, if his personality was just a bit more mild like a mood stabilizer he's like Adam Sandler with like a nine to five job but It's so funny because I'll talk about it and what we've been watching lately, but I've been going through the Meet the Parents and then Meet the Fockers series with uh, Ben Stiller. So I've had a lot of Ben and Adam in my life (laughs) this last week. Adam Sandler is getting more palatable. He is. And I don't know if that is like, because it was always, I never really liked any of his movies. Like Billy Madison is awful um and I think also the thing is like he makes these little like stupid little sounds (laughs) yes yeah and like acts like a child and then women fall for that which like tell me tell me and without telling me that a male wrote this um but I think he's been getting better and like more toned down especially in like murder mystery Mm -hmm. this movie so I'm like did a female get involved (laughs) (laughs) he he found like a female producer Mm -hmm. um yeah and I even texted you that like this was a movie that I considered to be in that era of when I was not an Adam Sandler fan because it's like kind of around the time of Happy Gilmore Billy Madison wedding singer just like stuff where he he goes like (laughs) (laughs) he does that a lot (laughs) and like I was pretty young when I was watching those movies and like I feel like it was shows that like guys my age and older guys really appreciated not to like like divide movie preferences based on sex or anything but it just seemed like it was more of this like raunchy just like gross humor which it seemed like in my age group a lot of the guys preferred 
And I kind of like wrote Adam Sandler off in my mind a little bit. So I I think I remember watching this movie, but not really having a super like big opinions about it. But upon the rewatch, I feel like it's not like at all the humor from his like earlier movies. It's not that like raunchy gross stuff. I thought it was just kind of like sweet. And like, of course, it's still Adam Sandler, who's kind of a mediocre looking guy, <laughs> um, like falling for Drew Barrymore, who is just adorable in this movie. But yeah, yeah like, Drew Barrymore did the rewrites. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, because I think, I don't know. I think it was always the like, this grown man who acts like a child somehow pulls in these very attractive women in a way that I don't think is realistic. And I think you can tell that it was written by a man because men <laughs> like younger women, <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio. And, you know, they like, like, the, like, I mean, like women naturally, like, pitch their voices up sometimes or um act more baby girl um for the male gaze in a way that like I don't think immature men really have that same appeal for women so that was just my take um so I think a woman got involved here and thank you to them yeah I definitely like his like uh like I think the turning point for me for Adam Sandler movies was like 2010 I started to like him more with grown-ups which I did like which still I feel like has no. <laughs> I, I know I like grown-ups I like the ensemble cast um I think that's a really funny movie and um he works with like those actors from grown-ups like a lot but I like these oh I had like a I had like a sleepover and I let the friends that I was sleeping over with who were coming over to my house, pick the movie, and they picked grown-ups, and I think I stopped being friends with them. <laughs> they never came over again. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I liked grown-ups, and then I didn't really come back to him um, until, yeah, the murder mystery series, and then one of his, well, everyone talks about Uncut Gems, which apparently, I actually have Uncut no Gems. A- uncut gems um <laughs> it was his muse <laughs> and uncut gems um I actually never saw it I I feel like I would like to see that movie see it. um I actually I think punch drunk love is good I was in a high school play where they talked about like the absurdism there was a line about the absurdism of Adam Sandler and they're like except for punch drunk love which is actually a really good film <laughs> and that line has stayed with me but it has never convinced me to actually watch that movie <laughs> watch it or google anything about it yeah <laughs> that's that's how i feel about uncut gems because i feel like that was like 2019 twitter was only about uncut gems and i still know absolutely nothing about <laughs> this movie's plot or like even the tone i i think it's a more serious film and I'm pretty sure he's maybe like a mobster or something. I I don't know, but I I would like to look at Uncut Gems. And then a recent one, more recent from him, was um Hubi Halloween, H- Hubi Halloween, I think it was, which I actually liked as well. It was still a little bit on his sillier and absurdist side, but I actually really enjoyed it. So I think it's been like a both me becoming like more open to Adam Sandler and the absurdity of some of some of him his films and then him simultaneously like toning himself down a little bit um that has made like the perfect combination in his last couple movies um but yeah all that being said what did you think about 50 first dates or what was your impression on this rewatch Um, I like it. And I think that's the thing also with this movie is that like, you don't, you get, you look at a movie that has Adam Sandler and you don't expect to cry. And I cry at this movie. Yeah. Every (laughs) single time. Um, like the, like, oh my God, like I can feel it. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I don't know. There's something about that that like gets me. Um, I don't know. I think it, I think it's, it's cute. I mean, I couldn't, I feel like this time I was a little bit more critical of it Hmm. um of like the I don't know Adam Sandler's character is kind of creepy um and (laughs) like I don't know at least at least he's like not getting women drunk and everything um and like letting them have consent even if they don't like fully realize it so we do applaud him for that one but otherwise he's just like kind of icky and like 
he could kind of kill her at any time. And Lucy has no survival skills except if she has a bat. And I'm just a little bit worried about that. Um, but yeah, I, I I watched this movie and it made a very big impact on me um, because I wrote a play where the main character has the same like condition um, and she got into a car accident, but it was like she had just finished studying for her SATs. So like her SAT vocab words are like in her head and all of this stuff. And then I was oh. still like in my pretentious moment um, where I don't think I had done any comedy or anything yet. And so people were like coming up to me because I did this for high school and then we did like a um, premiere kind of thing for high school and people were coming up to me and they're like, wow, this reminds me a lot of 50 first dates. And I was like, I've never seen it. That's so weird, <laughs> which I had, but I was like, kind of like, I was like, ah, never heard of it. That's such a weird coincidence. <laughs> Maria. I, don't know I lied about that, but <laughs> yeah, I had seen it. Um, you yeah. are a devious, devious person. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're like I actually I don't know do you think they used me as the source material for this movie <laughs> should I like, get the law involved they're like, you're like should we contact my lawyers and your high school classmates were like no this came out in 2004 um I'm actually pretty sure that they could sue you <laughs> you're like I don't know haven't heard of it never heard of it <laughs> 50 wait how many dates how many dates did you say <laughs> Oh was gosh. it 49? 49 first dates? What was the name of the movie? <laughs> like, off to Google it later. <laughs> right. Um, but Brooke, what did you think of this movie? I'm especially interested to talk to you because you're a Hawaiian from Hawaii. You love spam. Did you feel represented? I do, yeah. I, I, feel I, would, accurate? Say, I would say let's put some clear uh, terminology that I definitely should not be called. Well, I guess I'm from the state of Hawaii, but to call myself a, a Hawaiian, probably not the best, <laughs> the best okay. look there. Um, but definitely a distinction there. I well, will okay, say, but you're, you're a white Hawaiian. <laughs> yeah. And that's white, perfect for this movie. <laughs> white Hawaiian, perfect for Drew Barrymore. Uh, definitely not native Hawaiian. Maybe mm -hmm. that's the distinction we need to place there. Um, which if we're talking about how this film is problematic, we said it maybe hasn't aged that well since 2004 in the last 20 years. I actually had the complete like opposite reaction because I remember the first time I watched it, it was similar to like the critical thinking that you did this time where it was like, this is like dangerous and he could be a predator and like, you know, the family members are clearly thinking that too. And they think that this man could easily take advantage of her. Um, and that's why they're so hesitant to have him even be involved. And I remember the first time I watched it, I was like, this is a horror movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was, I was like, this is a cautionary tale and it's horrible. And then this time I watched it, it was like on Valentine's Day. And I was like, this is true love. <laughs> I was like, this is so sweet. Um, so I actually didn't find any of that problematic. But if we're talking about Hawaiians, it's like, Rob Schneider that plays Ula. So I Googled yeah. and I believe he's just Jewish American. Um, not at all someone who should be playing a, a native Hawaiian man in this film. Um Ula El is a, King. Yeah. El King it's is so his weird to make that daughter. connection. <laughs> yeah, El King is his daughter. I think Rob Schneider is in grown ups too. Um and is El King in grown ups or he just has like he just has her as a child. Yeah, he has her as a child, but I think the thing in Grown Ups is, like, Rob Schneider's daughters are all, like, super hot and, like, 10 feet tall. <laughs> um, oh. But but anyways, Rob Schneider plays, like, a Native Hawaiian in this film, which is obviously not a great thing and has not aged well um, over the last 20 years. And I feel like Hawaiian, um, like, politics have come more to the forefront after COVID because um, I think people were thinking a lot more about, like, the local like population and how their resources have been stripped post COVID and how, you know, a lot of people say that the native Hawaiians are like begging people not to come. And then I also see discourse about how a lot of the like native population or just like the local Hawaiians that may not be native Hawaiian may could be like white that live there also like then rely on this tourism and stuff. So lots of discourse happening. Um, but yes, for those that did not know, I was born um, not in o Oahu where this movie takes place, but I was born on the big island. 
Um, and my parents lived in Hawaii for like 20 years. And then I moved um, from Hawaii to Pennsylvania when I was six years old. So definitely was like the first place that I grew up, but my memories are somewhat limited. Like I very much remember like the kindergarten, but um, you know, not really any of the like political aspects that I would just talked about. But it, all that being said, from my perspective, um, like fairly accurate representation of Hawaii, like spam definitely is um, like a part of the cuisine there. And um, spam musubi was my favorite food growing up. And um, I think with like a lot of um, Asian like countries or cultures, which Hawaii is like a mix of a bunch of, you know, Native Hawaiian and then different Pacific Islanders. Um, and then like Japanese culture is very prevalent there too in the cuisine. And um, something that like is prevalent in some of these Asian countries is like you can get all of these like foods at like 7-Eleven or other like gas stations, which if you said like, <laughs> basically when we moved from Hawaii to Pennsylvania, my world was rocked because the 7-Eleven <laughs> was like luxury, like cuisine, uh, like my favorite foods all in a row spam musubi like homemade by the owners and you could go in you could get spam musubi go out and then moved here 7-elevens in mainland u.s are like the bottom feeders of gas stations <laughs> it's like you don't go there unless like you have to um so i was very i was very shook by the convenience store differences there um and i watched like all these people like going to japan and filming these tiktoks of like all the like Japanese 7-Elevens and all the different foods that you can get there. And it's like all of these really yummy stuff for way less um, than like U.S. prices would be. Um, but yeah, so spam is definitely a huge part of the culture. Spam and eggs is a very popular dish that I had. Um, what about Reese's peanut butter cups? No, <laughs> I didn't, didn't, didn't uh, ever see that <laughs> happening. Um, but yeah, so all that being said, that was kind of the only maybe potential didn't age well moment that I saw with Rob Schneider's um depiction of a native Hawaiian Ula. Um and then again with like the early 2000s like fat joke humor, very prevalent. Mm -hmm. Like the basically like the entire character of Ula. If we just got rid of him and maybe replaced him with some actual representation, this movie would have aged perfectly. Um because mm -hmm. like his, his transgender as a oh as yeah. a joke was also yeah. When did I I rewatched this like a couple weeks ago now, and I can't I remember they said something about it, but I couldn't remember the context. Is it with his, um, the assistant Alexa, or when does the joke come in? No, it's like um, Lucy is meeting up with her old friends, and oh, she's like, "Oh, I'm yes. so glad you got the gender realignment surgery or whatever," and then that character is kind of treated as like a joke that no one really talks to. So that definitely is not appropriate either. Um, but yeah, in terms of the like dangerousness that we were talking about, I think I definitely, like I said, saw this as more of like, I was more in a hopeful it's Valentine's day kind of mood. And I saw it this time. I was like, wow, you know, it is like a scary situation, but like, isn't it beautiful that, even though this is obviously a very comedic, lighthearted take on, like, someone suffering from, like, a disability. I was like, isn't it beautiful that she can have, like, a full life and she has someone that's willing to make her, like, fall in love with her every single day? So, I don't know. I, don't know. I was pessimistic where I was like, if I, if someone played me a VHS tape... Yeah. And it had in black and white text, Lucy, everything is going to be okay. I would think everything is not okay. <laughs> yeah, I will. No, and I totally get that. And I'm sure like if I wa were to watch this like on a bad day, I would again go back to my take that this is absolutely a horror movie. <laughs> um, because like a question that I have is like, if someone were to play you this tape, like how quickly would you be calling the cops? Because I would be like, in full like I am in a simulation nothing is real like they they portray Drew Barrymore's character Lucy as like insanely trusting and optimistic mm -hmm. and I think that if we're gonna like get dive into the details of it I think like a big part of that is she has like her brother and her father as these like mm -hmm. 
anchors for reality for her um because her mom has passed away in some other like subplot of the story her mom is no longer there she's very close with her dad and her brother it's really sad because i believe if we go back to the lore her mother was murdered by cows (laughs) okay so real cow issue here (laughs) on the on the island of hawaii she was murdered murdered <laughs> wasn't um, the best execution we'll t- uh, we'll take that back to the <laughs> to the drawing board um but yeah i think sh- she has her father and her dad and so like i'm like they said they even voice like the concerns of like what's gonna happen when lucy wakes up and she's like an 80 year old woman and she like doesn't mm-hmm. recognize herself in the mirror so i think there are all of these logistics that are very scary to try to think through But I think the movie is also, like, hinting at the fact that even though she isn't able to, like, retain these, like, conscious memories, that she is having some sort of memory process where she's singing the song, she's dreaming about these people, and she's, like, painting him. So hopefully, like, a different part of her brain is able to kind of subconsciously know that she's um, with someone safe. But personally... Personally, I've watched Criminal Minds <laughs> too much. <laughs> like, I've watched Criminal Minds. I've watched true crime podcasts. And I watch a lot of sci-fi. So I would be like, no. I'd be like, I am absolutely in a simulation. And if it's not a simulation, I have been drugged and captured. And am like, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll go along with your little video. And then I would end up murdering Adam Sandler. <laughs> There is a book like this where, like, someone has amnesia and then she wakes up every day and the guy's like, don't worry, I'm your husband, this is what you missed. And then it, like, comes out that she's, like, a kidnapping victim. Um, See? That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, also kind of, you said that kind of reminds me of, like, um, Don't Worry Darling a little bit, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever talked about on the pod but you know people have their own opinions of it but that is kind of like a very interesting idea to think about like someone being constantly drugged being somehow put in this like memory um simulation thing all happening within their mind but yeah on the positive side of it though um like I said I did just think it was kind of cute that Mm -hmm. he was willing to you know like the tagline of this movie is like you know making her fall in love with you every single day and like starting from scratch and having someone willing to do that I was like this is like if he wanted to he would (laughs) (laughs) like putting this on my dating profile I'm like if you're not willing to do this you know don't even bother swipe left or whatever (laughs) yeah Um, I think a reason why this works as well is I feel like Drew Barrymore is just playing herself yeah like tell me Lucy wouldn't be like if you can go outside in the rain, don't miss the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, it was perfectly cast, which is why I said, like, they they portray Lucy, you know, as, like you said, Drew Barrymore basically being herself as this, like, unfailingly, like, trustworthy and optimistic person. And, like, everyone, you know, that knew her before the accident, like, the, the owner of the diner um, and the the like waiter there the cook um say the same thing that like lucy has always been like incredibly sweet incredibly kind Mm -hmm. um which then nothing nothing ever ends well for a teacher i'm telling you (laughs) teachers are doomed which let me just say not not entirely a remake but i love the job security that adam sandler has (laughs) because the job security the job flexibility because he's a veterinarian you know for like a you know aquarium or something on the island or maybe like a rehab center that then you know helps these animals get back into the ocean but he is gone from work for like 45 hours going on a huge trip (laughs) he's like a researcher apparently but I'm like, do you, like, do you clock in and clock out? Like, are you getting your Well, it seems like hours? he lives there as well. <laughs> he like, does. <laughs> like, I, I feel like they didn't fully flesh that out. So if I'm going to get into more technical critiques of the movie, that's never fully explained if he has a home or if he just is, like, living in the vet office, which I feel like they're, like, the 
the like OSHA laws are very like mm-hmm. much not in place. <laughs> like maybe he, he has to be there overnight for emergencies. I don't know if he is he like on call. Is he? <laughs> yeah, maybe he's on call because like he sure as hell is not like doing a nine to five because he's literally like wooing Lucy like every single day for multiple hours, <laughs> um, going on these adventures. But yeah, so I love that, and then also, um. Lucy, like, thank God she was an artist because mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like also this this plot and her personality is hinging on the fact that, you know, she she can create and she's an artist and she's like, you know, she's dreaming and then we go into her studio and there's like 50 different artistic styles <laughs> of, <laughs> of uh, Adam Sandler, which I guess I don't know much about being an artist, but like, my thought was that professional artists usually stay within kind of one stylistic medium, maybe dabble into others. She has one that's like, I don't know, I took one art class. Let me just call out some names that I know, but it was like impressionist and like cubism. Like she is all over the map to like with these different versions of Adam Maybe Sandler. she can't remember what art she does. Yeah, she's just but dabbling. But also I- thank God it was like a Sunday or whatever instead of a Monday. Like can you imagine? Do they have to would they have to hire high school kids to sit in the same class every day? Yeah. They're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's funny that they tried to do a recreation of that day for her. Um but I will yeah. say that like little cafe or whatever the diner has steady business for life (laughs) they were like this is a tragedy but I know I have a a regular customer coming Mm -hmm. in um but yeah back to my point I was like thank god she was an artist because like imagine she was like an accountant or something (laughs) and then she's like yeah like I don't know who you are but like, come and look at this. And it's just like an Excel spreadsheet (laughs) with like different like data entry points that look like Adam Sandler's face. But like, also, if I was like an accountant and I kept having like recurring dreams of that man, I would have no way to express that stylistically. Mm -hmm. So she's also, if it's not the Excel spreadsheet, it's like, look at this. And she has like a little post-it stick man drawing figure of Adam Sandler. She's written boobs upside down on the calendar. (laughs) She's like, this reminds me of you for some reason. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I thought that was funny. And then if we're getting into like the more nitpicky stuff, I did think that the like, inciting moment of this film where he's you know off in his boat and then it it like something goes wrong so he has to go to this diner that he's never been to before and he sees Lucy um I feel like you know they built him up as this like womanizer like trust issues doesn't want to settle down for the first like 15 minutes in the movie and then just like a switch like flips (laughs) and he suddenly wants to be like an amazing guy and pursue a woman that literally is so difficult to pursue and he will never get any like it basically before that like he's a womanizer all he's getting from this woman is like physical like you know physical stuff from them like basically he's just having sex with these women no emotional connection and then he completely complete 180 to like he basically never has like physical connection with um lucy because it's all about like building up to having that connection and they like i think have sex like one time and then at least another time because they have a daughter together. <laughs> um, so I feel like the film didn't quite do enough for me there in terms of like why he was so willing to pursue her. It said like, oh, I just can't get her out of my head when I'm trying to womanize. But they only took like five minutes to like yeah. five minutes of film time to to kind of flesh that out and then just dove into the into the dates. So Yeah, if- and then the switch also between like we're in love, we're gonna get married, and then, like, oh, you're breaking up with me, okay, and, like, he fought her for, like, five minutes about, like, (laughs) I still want to be with you, it's a full life without you, and then, like, a half second later, he's on there on the Google Doc editing her diary or whatever, (laughs) like, it just, it didn't take very much convincing, it was a very, like, okay, I'm totally fine with, like, you writing me out of your memories, um, which maybe maybe in a way that's like 
respecting her boundaries but like I don't know there wasn't any kind of it was like a very quick switch to um I am your typist now <laughs> and an active participant in the breakup and the um mixing up of your memories I don't know yeah I think part of me thought that like he maybe thought that he could still like win her back again Like, Mm -hmm. because it resets every time and he didn't even think he was, like, gaining any ground with her. I think maybe he thought that, like, even if it was a breakup, like, there was always room in the future for him to, like, start pursuing her again. So maybe there was that. But yeah, I feel like they could have taken a little bit more time to, like, build up the actual, like, initial connections for the both of them Mm -hmm. um, and, like, why he was doing this. But... Yeah, any other thoughts or specific scenes that you wanted to call out before we go into our remakes? I wanted to say one more thing because I think I was never like into Lord of the Rings or (laughs) The Hobbit or anything. And so this was my first introduction to Sean Astin. No, it was Um, not. It was. Stranger Things, right? Yeah, but Stranger Things. Oh, but you saw this way. Okay, okay. So you saw this way back. (laughs) Yeah. So and now it's like really hard to see him in things because I see like the titty dance or whatever. Like I hadn't seen him in in Encino Man because I hadn't been obsessed with Brendan Fraser yet. I hadn't Mm -hmm. seen him in Stranger Things. I hadn't seen him as Samwise. Um, So this is like the role that I think of when I think of Sean Astin. And I think that is maybe tragic. That is tragic. I know that people have talked about that. Um, because, you know, it's like, so you turn on Lord of the Rings and you see Samwise Gamgee and you're like, oh my God, there's that guy from 50 First Dates. <laughs> is he off the juice? <laughs> <laughs> He's off the steroids now. Um, and I know that people on Twitter were talking about that too, especially when Stranger Things came out because he's Bob from Stranger Things. And I think that like the biggest sign that you're getting older is that newer generations are watching these things and they're doing the exact same thing where like they turn on Lord of the Rings and they're like I can't believe that's Bob or like they don't even turn on Lord of the Rings they only know Sean Astin as Bob from Stranger Things or the guy from 51st Dates and part of me dies a little bit inside but I'm sure that like I did that to my parents too (laughs) like with famous actors like I know Robert De Niro as like the guy from Meet the Parents, <laughs> and not like any of his previous much more serious work. So uh, it's it's a burden that we all must face when we age. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, did you want to move into the remakes then? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I didn't have too many this time around, so I'll go through them real quick here. Um. So as we talked about, you know, with our own dating experiences, I thought if we were to remake 50 First Dates, we would want to, you know, recontextualize it in this modern dating world, which is kind of insane to think about because I think like the statistics are something like crazy, like 80% or more of people are only finding their like current partners through dating apps and only like 20% is from like in-person interaction or like friend to friend friend Mm -hmm. of a friend like recommendations um so you know I think we were to do 50 first dates 2024 version it would be on like the tinder or hinge or bumble app or whatever and she would unfortunately just be opening up the app and then just you know rematching with the same guys (laughs) every single time um and you know this is on like not a unique experience unfortunately even if she does not have brain trauma um because I tweeted about this a while back like they let me just say the dating pool in Cleveland Ohio is um minimal and you know very scary at best and there was like multiple guys that I like messaged like once with and they were lame so just never replied again in the message thread and then like a, a full year later then rematched with the same people And that has happened on multiple occasions. And every time the guy's like, didn't we match already? And the last time this happened, I was like, oh, yeah, we did. Ding, ding, ding. Round two. And then shout out to this guy because he literally asked me. He was like, oh, yeah, last time I think you said you had a podcast, right? What was it called? And I was like, I do. It's called Remake Hot Take. 
And as soon as I said that, he immediately unmatched with me. <laughs> so we have we have a hater out there. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that story. But yeah, I think poor Lucy just keeps swiping and rematching, and these guys just keep being like, "Hey, you look familiar," and she's like, "You don't." <laughs> oh, I man. like the idea of the person that she matched with the day before the accident, and then um brother and dad grabs the phone and they like erase all the messages yeah so every morning this one guy wakes up with like hey <laughs> with three wives yeah he's like wow I'm just really not getting anywhere with this girl <laughs> but yeah so I think 51st tinder dates um and then the next remake would be you know a key part of like Lucy's quirky personality is that she's at the diner every morning and with her favorite breakfast, which is waffles, she likes to make little houses and stuff out of them. So I think we really like expand upon that portion of her personality. And I think that each date, the waffle houses get just structurally more complicated and challenging um, until one day, uh, Buddy from Cake Boss <laughs> appears. And I think that one of the little episodes of her date life is that she um has to use her talents and then she is now on cake boss um and she just is creating wild uh architectural structures out of out of waffles um and cake she she expands i like the world building that you've done here thank you like once you get to a certain level of baked good um construction but he just appears yeah you get scouted like it's like it's like a model agency like literally she's in that waffle or she's in that diner every single day making a waffle house there the people talk like it's hawaii it's a tourist location the celebs like the famous are going to that diner and they're like hey this girl's pretty good and but i i think that her skills build and build and build you know just like her, you know, subconscious memory is able to remember um, Adam Sandler's character. I think that she would be a, like a Waffle House expert at this point because it used to be something. Well, maybe she... she opens Waffle House and this she... is how Waffle House. Forms. <laughs> this is how Waffle House forms. Um, yes, but I feel like Lucy wouldn't like like the violence and the just like degenerate crowd. Well, that no, seems every to single gather. day she wakes up and she's like. This is going to be a beautiful establishment where we're going to break bread together. And then it evolves into something that is scary, but no one tells her. No one tells her. She wakes up every day. She's like, this isn't a waffle house. This is a waffle home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, okay. And then the last one, like we just touched on, Sean Astin mostly famous in my opinion for his portrayal of Samwise Gamgee in Lord of the Rings um if you notice the brother is not present um when they're at that final scene when they're in Alaska it's just like it's grandpa with like Adam Sandler and their child um and that is because uh her brother is taking the ring to Mordor (laughs) um with Frodo and I like to think that you know, Lord of the Rings and Fifty First Dates exist within the exact same, you know, realm. So like Hawaii is in Middle Earth. They they do get on the boats to the Undying Lands. Um, and then they have to, you know, then continue the journey. So is he on steroids in that movie or yeah. do you think he's beat it? Okay. No, he is on the juice. He is for sure on steroids and it's actually part of the reason why he can resist the powers of the one true ring. Um, I think that his head is just so full of like roid rage um, that it just, you know, it clogs any potential influence from external evil forces. Um, And yeah, that's why he's able to like lift Frodo up the mountain. He's like, I can't carry the ring for you, but I can carry you. And that's the roids talking. He would not have been able to do that otherwise. He's a gardener, quote unquote. Um, So yeah, I think they're in the same, absolute same universe. He is not on the boat in Alaska because he had much bigger fish to fry. Um, So yeah, those are my remakes. What about you, Maria? 
Um, well, like what we've been talking about, I was thinking that this would be a really good horror movie. Um, if it was like, I don't know, I, I can't think of a good title for it, like 51st um, Attempts, I don't know, 51st Attacks, I don't know. But it's like this murderer has heard of this girl whose memory resets every day. So every day he tries to like kidnap her in different ways. <laughs> um, and then he finally succeeds. And then he opens up with the video that's like, Lucy, everything is okay. Um because I think that would be that would be a good setup. Like he's constantly like, you know, stopping traffic to get yeah, her and stuff. I, I like to think that it would be like a part of the like Saw franchise crossover. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's like I think those people like wake up with like a bit of amnesia. They don't know how they got there. So she just wakes up. They play the little, you know, <laughs> the little infomercial <laughs> of a little tape. And I like to think that it's the guy from Saw. And he just gets to, like, test out, like, all his contraptions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's, like, the perfect victim. Mm-hmm. And he goes in there and, you know, he has one with, like, the, I don't know, snake pit and then, like, a needle pit. And he's, like, oh, my God, I just love getting to, you know, release my creativity. He's, like, blank slate every day. Like, please give honest feedback <laughs> at the and end of every session. he does say something about, like, when he captures her every time, if you think about it. I'm kind of a painter or an artist as well. He would. He would. (laughs) He'd be like, it's not traditional, but this is my canvas. And then Mm -hmm. opens up the room to the creepy things. I love it. (laughs) Um, And then I was also thinking that this would be a good title for a documentary um, about any woman um, (laughs) in the 51st States that they go on. um, Because I think... When this started, maybe in 2004, maybe 50 was like, they put 50 as like a wild number of like, this has happened 50 times, but pickings are slim now. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think 51st States is, uh, is lowballing it, I would say. <laughs> um, so Those just are rookie say, numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a documentary of, of dating in the 2020s from the perspective of any woman (laughs) um and then my last one is um you know she has the song like the wouldn't it be nice by the beach boys or whatever but i think that she should sing the 2004 hit hey ya by outcast um they're like there's something you should see she only does this when on days she meets you and she goes hey (laughs) yeah Hey! Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah, she only does that on days she meets you. Um, those are the only things that I had. I do have some um, fun facts, I guess. If you would like, yeah, hit me with them. I think I've talked about this before, but um, Adam Sandler he went to NYU, and I did live in his um dorm building, um, where his he met his um what's it called like collaborator or whatever Mm -hmm. um and then like his collaborator's son went there and met I think John Higgins who was and then they created um what's it called please don't destroy so so um some movie magic happened there with Adam Sandler meeting his collaborator and then his collaborator's son meeting in that same dorm building meeting John Higgins who is Steve Higgins son and then they created please don't destroy for SNL um and I lived there too (laughs) so I was a I was a major component (laughs) as as well for that um and then Drew Barrymore obviously a very very nepo baby um she's from what they call on Wikipedia a British American acting dynasty do you know how nepo you have to be a dynasty dynasty (laughs) Um, but there was a guy named Herbert Arthur Chamberlain Blythe, who was also known as Morris Barrymore, who was an Indian born st- British stage actor. And he married Georgiana Drew Barrymore, who was an a- American actress and comedian. And they had three kids, Lionel, Ethel, and John. Ethel won an Oscar for her performance in None But the Lonely Heart. And was nominated three more times. Lionel was um, evil Mr. Potter from 
It's a Wonderful Life, if you've ever seen that. Um, and he won an Oscar for A Free Soul. And then John was a silent movie star. Um, and then John had a son, um, John Drew Barrymore, who was mm-hmm. a TV actor. And then his daughter was Drew Barrymore. So they became a dynasty. Um, so very, very Nepo. Um, don't know how we feel about that. And then I feel like who we don't talk about a lot is Sean Astin, um, yeah. very Nepo, mm-hmm. um, which I didn't know. So his mom, Patty Duke, won an Oscar for her role as Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker and won a bunch of like Golden Globes, Emmy. She has a star on the Hollywood uh, Walk of Fame. And his stepdad is John Astin, who is famous for starring as Gomez Adams in the Adams Family TV series. Oh. So didn't realize any of that. But Brooke, what have you been watching lately? All right. I haven't watched as much. Um, still been reading the Son of Neptune books. I've been trying to read more than I have been watching <laughs> these last couple of weeks. But um, I have, like I said, at the beginning of the pod, been doing the Meet the Parents um, series. So Meet the Parents, then the sequel, Meet the Fockers, and then the um, third one in the trilogy uh, is, oh no, yeah, Little Fockers is the third one. Um, I haven't finished the third one yet, uh, but I did remember watching that when it first came out in, I think, 2010. Um, and I really like the series. I watched it with my roommate. I don't think she's as much of a fan. She called it, like, like raunchy, silly humor, um, which I think when you compare it to, like, Adam Sandler, I, I don't think <laughs> that's uh, it's as raunchy and silly as she thinks it is. But I do really like that series. Um, I think that Robert De Niro is a great comedic actor. Um, and his like whole shtick is always like, isn't he scary? <laughs> like that's his whole whole thing, but I think it, it works really well. Um, so we watched that. And then I also, oh my gosh, watched on Hulu like the first hour of a movie called, I think, Freelance, um, with John Cena and oh yeah, Allison Bree. Um, so it's John Cena and Alison Brie, and it is the worst movie maybe ever, uh, maybe ever in the world. Had to turn it off after, like, I think the runtime was like an hour and 20 minutes, and I think maybe I only made it like 40 minutes in. It's about John Cena was like a military man or something, and then he like got out of the business when he got married, but now he's being asked by his friend to be like a freelance like it's how it always it's how it always it always happens your friend pulls you back in and he's like a freelance bodyguard out of his friends like agency for Allison Brie who plays a journalist going to like some country where there's a dictator and like the whole thing is like hey the dictator is actually really nice (laughs) he's actually a really good guy um so it was just it was horrible like horrible Mm -hmm. If you want to, like, not even laugh, maybe laugh if you, like, are really drunk or, like, high or something, <laughs> I'm sure you'd get a kick out of this movie. But I was neither, so I turned it off. Um, and then I saw in theaters, which this is unheard of for me. I went to, like, two movies in a movie theater in over the course of, like, one month, um, which doesn't typically happen. Um, saw Lisa Frankenstein, which I actually really you're gonna say Madam Web, and I was worried for you. (laughs) No, although I'm sure like people are getting a kick out of that too. Apparently, like absolutely horrible, but a fun disaster to watch. Um, no, but I saw Lisa Frankenstein, um, which was actually like pretty good. I I did like um, wasn't it Robin Williams's daughter? I'm not sure. Is that the, is she the main character, Catherine Newton? No, she's the writer. Oh, then um maybe. Uh oh yeah, Zelda, directed by Zelda Williams. Mm-hmm. Um then yes, <laughs> <laughs> um the main character, uh, her name is Lisa, is played by Catherine Newton, and I I really liked her performance. I think this is like a tricky kind of thing to act. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, it very much needed to be like a very charismatic person, and. I feel like this is a movie that if I hadn't seen so many movies with my roommates that are kind of towing that line of like horror and just like strange horror, I wouldn't have liked this like four years ago. But now that I've seen 
so many of those movies kind of along the lines of like Beetlejuice-esque where it's just Mm -hmm. this absurd kind of gross kind of horror mix Um, and it's really good so that and then Cole Sprouse who has one line in the movie he plays like a reanimated corpse who cannot talk and um, it's very ridiculous very absurd but I had a good time watching it Um, and I feel like I would maybe want to watch it more like around Halloween time with like all the spooky vibes but it was really cute I did like it Um, and then lastly I watched um, The Impossible, which is like a 2012, yeah, Tom Holland's first, was it his first ever movie? I've entered the chat. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to say like at least first major role. I mean, he was on Billy Elliot, like on the West End or whatever oh, before. Okay. Um, but yeah, had you never seen it? No, had never oh my seen God. it. I think someone said Tom Holland was like 16, 15 or 16 when this was filmed he looks like a 10 year old boy um so maybe he was 15 16 maybe that like was inaccurate because he's definitely someone lied to you someone could have lied to me because he looks very young um but yeah tom, i love that movie tom holland early performance man i it mean is... we don't love the fact that it took a real like to yeah. high family <laughs> and made them white um, yeah but... I think it was a Spanish family that's what I was gonna say I watched yeah, the, something I watched the entire movie and I was like wow this is fabulous and then at the very end it was like based on a true story of like <laughs> yeah. Jose and Ramon and I was like what he was 14 I was, I was like I was like those are not uh British Scottish names like well, you was... can see how they changed everyone's names yeah um like instead of like Maria it's like Maria and um it's like instead of Tomas they just did Thomas <laughs> like yeah. they, they... <laughs> like literally I was like why is there like a tilde here I was like <laughs> I was like that is not a a British person's name so then my roommate and I like googled it and it was like oh yeah this was like a Spanish family Spanish either from Spain or maybe like I don't know some Latin American country and mm-hmm. like I think it even said like the directors were like well we wanted to make them like british white people to like make this story more universal and i was like ah! <laughs> i was like oh, that is that looks so bad like why well, on all earth? of the the director and the screenwriter um they were both spanish i know i saw so that I'm too like, i was like what what happened so maybe it was guys? like production company interference i don't know yeah maybe something happened with yeah, higher up warner brothers <sighs> warner brothers so like we talked about it <laughs> they so easily like it, if they were gonna base this on a true story like i would be so offended like if it literally was like if i was that family based on my like harrowing true story of surviving this like it, like absolutely devastating tsunami and they were like we're gonna have you and mcgregor play you <laughs> i'd be like well he's fabulous but like why could we not have gotten spanish actors um to play this true story so that was very bad but if we're you know taking that aside um, which I did not even know until the end of the movie when they show the actual family's names. I was like, what the fuck is happening here? Mm-hmm. Um, but taking all that aside, it was a great movie. It was, my roommate said it was like one of her favorites. So, and I had never seen it. So, um, and I, and I do love like disaster apocalypse ones, usually not based on a true story. I usually like a bit more absurdist disaster films, as I've said before on the pod. Um, but this one was great and I was like how did they film this it's one of those movies where like holy shit how did they do this Mm because like it it looked so good a lot of it looked like practical effects and stunts and stuff and um, it was just crazy and then like I was like sobbing at the end when they all finally reunite with each other and Tom Holland gives like an excellent performance too for such a little kid well, um, I eat, I always eat up things where it's like missed connections and it's yeah. like he turns down the hallway and then his dad comes in and it's like turn around it's <laughs> like it's that feeling of like a horror movie where it's like turn around the villains there but like less high stakes because it's a happy ending like I he's right behind you mm-hmm. <laughs> it's but your dad <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah it was great and I like my like I audibly gasped and my jaw like actually dropped when 
um the mom who got like the the like brunt force of like all the traumatic things happened to her um and she had like these severe wounds and I like literally my jaw dropped it is a very like gory scene in the first 20 minutes when her um she has this leg injury where Mm -hmm. Tom's like walking behind her and her like leg flap of flesh like goes back and I was like I got like heartburn <laughs> instantly. I, I got like stress heartburn. I still can't watch when she pulls the little wire out of her throat. Yeah. And the fact that like she actually did that, like they actually put a wire down Naomi Watts' throat and she actually pulled that out. I still, I can't watch yeah. it. Like I can't, I can't do any of that. Yeah, I I Googled that too because I didn't know what the fuck was happening when that started. I was like, so did she swallow like fishing line somehow when like the tsunami happened? So I Googled that and then I saw, yeah, that they had like blackberry jam on a string that she had to like pull out during filming. So again, looks like they did a lot of like practical effects stuff, but it it paid off. No one won an Oscar, I don't think. I don't know, but it it paid off visually because this is a movie that felt like viscerally real like so many times that I was like, holy crap, how did they do this? Um, I can't believe it had like been off my radar and I hadn't seen it before. Um, But yeah, totally drawing. I think that it's like, you know, like other issues with the movie. I know that people, you know, the criticism about casting these like white British people um, to play this instead of what the actual family was, but also... I know people had some issues with it being like one of the stories about like tourists that were in the area when Mm -hmm. tourists were only like 3% of the population. And obviously it was, it was like Thai people that were devastated mostly by the tsunami. And it was, um, especially with making them white, it was like a, a white story for a population that then was completely devastated and their stories didn't even really get told. They were like background characters in this. Um, but I did think it was, like I said, like, crazy effects that they did I don't think that a movie made today would look that good honestly Mm -hmm. um and I thought it was really really interesting so would definitely Mm -hmm. recommend giving it a watch I think it's on Netflix Mm, I have it's one of the one things that I have on DVD I had watched it and then I made my parent my family my whole family watch it on New Year's Eve I did a (laughs) Dunkirk and the impossible double feature and I ruined New Year's that Um, is anyway horrible (laughs) Maria those are two awful movie choices for a holiday thank you Mm -mm. um and you were mad at your high school friends for playing grown ups (laughs) grown ups is gross like the little breastfeeding I don't know I always think about that no, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> All right, what have you been watching? Um, I've been trying to look for a new show to watch that like I don't have to watch like on like limited release or like whatever. Um, so I tried Paranoid, which is one season. Um, and it's like about um the this these detectives in England who there's a murder in this small town of this like mom pushing her kid on the swings in a playground is like stabbed and I don't know it's it was it ends up connecting to like big pharma is attacking everyone and it was like very against like taking drugs and like everyone instead should be Quakers I don't know there was like a weird thing about it that wasn't good and all the characters are incredibly unlikable and should lose their jobs. <laughs> and it was like, it was like, it was, I, we were coming in on like season five of a cop show where we've already like learned to love these characters, but it was like, we were coming in on, on season one, <laughs> the like, the woman cop gets broken up with and she's screaming that she wants children and it was just a lot. Um, so it wasn't my favorite, but I did find it better than I also tried Collateral, um, which is like Carrie Mulligan, um, who Carrie Mulligan, like, I don't like, I love her, like, love her, but like, I don't know, her mouth always does that thing where she like, she, I feel like she knows a secret, um, which I think is kind of fun. You know what I'm talking about? Where Mm -hmm. she has like the kind of like pursed lips, which, and like, a very cool way of talking I don't know she's like that in everything which like 
I love her, but like, I don't know if that fit in with like a cop show where she's mm -hmm. like very kind of like soft spoken. And I was like, it's okay. It's going to be okay because Carrie Mulligan, who plays Kitty from Pride and Prejudice, is going to get us through <laughs> this. Um, I don't know. Um, but it was like, again, like a cop show that could have just been like a mystery, but then they decided to connect it to like, like illegal immigration in England but like without but it was like all about white people and like their thoughts on illegal immigration in England so it wasn't super satisfying um I did do like some research on it and because it has Billy Piper and it said on Wikipedia that she had like a big controversy because she married Chris Evans when she was 18 and he was 35 and I was like really when did this happen yeah that different I didn't Chris even... Evans oh <laughs> I was like I was like, I'm pretty sure when I was in my Chris Evan phase, I had done like some <laughs> good research on whether like, or not he, got he was remarried? unmarried. What? Um, but yeah, no, different, different guy. Um, mm -hmm. And then I started Cat Person, um, which is a movie on Hulu, um, which is based on like the really powerful short story um that went super viral about a woman who meets this guy who ends up like being like older and creepy um but they turned it into like he's a murderer in the movie and that like he's trying to murder everyone which like I mean I don't understand why you made a movie version of a short story um I don't think that was a super great idea um and it has Amelia Jones which like She's a good actress, but she looks too much like someone I hate um, that I don't enjoy her performances, which is no fault to her. Um, that is a me problem. Um, but that's what I think when I see her is I think I hate you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I haven't finished that and I don't know if I'm going to, but it has. And also like in the short story, it's like a very gross man that is trying to pursue her. And in this one, it's Nicholas Braun, <laughs> who I don't think is gross enough. Like, you know, the kid who who lights up in uh, Sky High. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think there's enough of an age gap that it's like super obvious. And I don't think that he's gross enough, um, and so, which is maybe why they added in the murderer storyline. But did you also know that um, his dad is a uh, former graphic designer and his dad co-designed that um the lips of Rolling Stone in their logo. Oh. Yeah. You didn't even know. You didn't even know the light up kid. <laughs> the freaking Nepo baby. They're everywhere. <laughs> They're everywhere. What I found out today is the guy on TikTok who does the roll for cereal. Mm -hmm. He has a bunch of Nepo connections as well. You can't even get roll for cereal guy anymore. Wow. But not us. Are you a nepo baby? I'm not. <laughs> Would you tell me? <laughs> I'm not, unless like you're in the OBGYN nursing world. <laughs> yeah. Then then I got connections, baby. <laughs> but yeah. Alrighty. Well, where can they find you and the pod, Maria? They can find me at Maria Schwarz everywhere and at Remake Hot Take everywhere for the pod we're starting to get bigger on twitter as i figured out how to follow other podcasts <laughs> that i didn't even think about doing before <laughs> um so now everyone wants to collaborate with us so um we'll see we'll see if we want to do that um brooke where can they find you um if they either want to like pick you up at a diner or um find you on social media yeah, I mean, they could, if someone left a trail of spam musubis, <laughs> they could snag me. <laughs> they could find me that way. I would follow that trail anywhere. Um, but if they just want to follow me on social media, then they can follow me at B underscore Reese Cup on Instagram. And my Twitter is still private. <laughs> but maybe I'll make it public if we're getting big on Twitter. <laughs> people... I mean, not that big you know <laughs> we got like 50 more followers yeah i'll think about it <laughs> we were almost at 200 on youtube and then we lost one Ugh. when we talked about how the dinosaurs in jurassic park may be transgender 
And that apparently yeah. pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't want those people anyways. Mm -hmm. So we didn't need them. All right. Well, thanks so much for watching. We will catch you later. Ooh. Bye. <laughs>